Okay. I wanted to, um, this is a little segue into a documentary you made uh, a couple of years ago, Big Shot, which yeah. Jay and I both grew up in Chicago um, in similar eras. We had the Bulls run, we had the Bears, we had some great kind of uh, generational defining teams. And I wanted to ask you about, you know, why you made that documentary, because you were there during that incredible Islanders dynasty. Right. And I guess the story, if you talk about John Spano and what the story is, and maybe because it, it was in, it was after that dynasty where Spano came in. So what was I was when I saw it a while ago, I thought this could be a revenge piece that Kevin's trying to. You know, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> you know, the, the way it came about was so. So for, first of all, yeah, I mean, as Chicago fans, yeah. you guys uh, could appreciate it. We have this, there's this monster run, right? And, you know, Long Island is is always going to be, you know, I'll get crucified for saying this, but the little brother of New York City, right? So for the Islanders to to reign supreme like that for so long, um, it was a special time for people on Long Island. And then when the wheels came off, my goodness, you never saw wheels come off like this in an organization. They just, they just fell apart, you know? Yeah. Um, and here comes this guy who, who wants to buy the team. And he runs in the right circles. He's friends with all the right people. But here's a guy with, who's got, you know, a couple hundred grand in the bank, walks into Fleet Bank of Boston and takes out an $80 million loan with a fake fax in 1996 or whenever this was. Purchases the team, fires the coach. He's trading guys. He's flying around on the team plane. For four months, he's got this going. And finally, somebody turns around and says, um, excuse me, who are you? Who is this guy? And then they started looking at him and he was missing payments. And the, the story just went from, from ridiculous to more ridiculous. Um, you know, he owed, a, he had to make a payment of, uh, you know, $17 million and, uh, he sent it for 1700 and then called his, you know, his accountant, a, a moron, you know, like, Oh, yeah. my accountant's a moron. I'll, I'll get the rest of that 16 million to you. So, um, but, you know, one of the ironic things is that the team was in such bad shape and this guy renegotiated the cable deal, right. which essentially kept the team on Long Island. So while he was doing all those things, he accidentally did something, uh, something that kept the team on Long Island. But when the you, movie, guys, when, you guys were vulnerable. You would have lost that team. I mean, the stadium's leaking. It's just, it, was, it was in the bad shape. The buildings decrepit ready, and everyone's they were ready thinking. to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At a time um, when Long Island was differentiating itself from New York, right? I correct. thought that was you trying to be, you know, you're your own place. And that's the one thing that's happening. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It's your own thing. And then it almost went away. So, so he yeah, ended up being a savior. I mean, I get, he's not a savior, but yes, I hear that cable deal. The yeah. cable deals did, did sort of save it. But, you know, when the, the movie came out, um, his boss for his job that he had, because he had, he had, he'd gone to jail for like eight or seven or eight years or something. And when the movie came out, his boss is like watching, you know, ESPN watches the movie and he goes, you know what? Let me just double check this. And he goes back and he starts looking at his books and he realizes that Spano has been stealing from his new employer. And when he oh, went before shit. the judge, the judge said, you know what? Enough for you. And gave him 10 years. So he's still currently in jail because of the movie. <laughs> You know, oh, which obviously you, but, wasn't my intention. You, but you, you sat down with him face oh, to I, face in interview. Oh, I got him down, and and it, and it pissed people off because nobody could get him for years. They wouldn't talk. But I had to like, I mean, this guy ran me through the ring. I basically had to date this guy for three months to finally get him on camera. Um, because he uh, thinks it's going to be a hit piece. But you're just yeah, coming well, at it from a myself, curiosity. Listen, I, I said to him, I said, listen, bro, let me explain this to you. I already got paid. I'm making this movie. I'm going to give you a chance to tell your side of the story. And if you are accountable and you poke fun at yourself and you don't take yourself so seriously and you stop lying for your teeth about everything, I promise you they're going to love you. And, and they did. He said when he went back to his hometown after the movie came out, he went to his like uh, fraternity reunion and he said he got a standing ovation. He said it was the best feeling I've had in 25 years. Like all of his college buddies loved it, you know? Um, but yeah, he was, he was just a, well, the funny story is, do you know who uh, Nick Santoro is? Nick Santoro, the writer, showrunner. I mean, he's, he's, he's yeah. huge. He's done a bunch of stuff, but <clears throat> he was the director of the movie and he had called me about net being the narrator. And I was like, absolutely. A hundred percent. I'm in. And then when he found out that ESPN didn't indemnify, he quit the movie and then, and then I slipped into the directing spot. 
because so I was like, fuck it, it, they could sue me. I don't know. What's he going to, what's he going to do? You know? So, yeah. cause the minute he sits down and, and starts talking and signs the waiver, <laughs> any, any threat of a lawsuit is, is obviously gone. But, um, yeah, ESPN does not indemnify it. Like, yo, if you get in legal trouble with this guy, don't talk to us, you know? Wow. So they scared off the director. Yeah. He got in a lot of legal trouble because he, when he got caught, he got busted. He gave the team back. He did right. like a mea culpa. And, and instead of holding on and putting it into bankruptcy and, you know, maybe he could have fished his way out of it and gotten some funding or something. He, he just was like, up, he, had, he tried to I, walk away. I think he had like Never 30, happened. I think he had 30 days to raise $5 million. And if he would have gotten that 5 million in 30 days, he would have owned the team outright. And there would have been nothing that anybody could have done about it. Now, granted, no. the players could have been on strike. Who knows what could have happened, but it would have been officially his team, which is crazy. Yeah, the, the story is incredible, especially it, you know when we think of all the fraud, the pyramid schemes were in these days of uh, fall fire festival stories. and, it, and- yeah, the, the Epstein's and the and the different hedge fund stuff that goes on. And this guy was like an OG, but he did it with a sports team. He also, changed. The- he changed the landscape for the the vetting process for every sport. Of course, yeah. of course, it happens in hockey. It's like I know you're a hockey guy. Hockey's my favorite sport. So of course, it happens in hockey. But then it changed the way they did it for everybody. Everybody had to step back and go, okay, sheesh. Lucky that happened to the hockey guys, but that can't happen in the <laughs> NFL or the NBA Bruce, or in the MLB. What, what, what was know? Bruce McNall's deal with the Kings too? Wasn't there a similar? The thing was, Bruce McNall was really rich though. Right. He really had the money. Yeah. The thing about Big Shot was this guy, you know, con- like convinced people that he had it and he didn't. Bruce McNall just got caught up in some other right. weird thing, but he actually had money behind him. And I think that's the, the biggest difference. Did did this guy ever call you when he was going back to jail and, and, and tell you? Hey, oh, yeah. No, he you, wanted me. He wanted me to the pay reason- for his lawyer. Wanted me to pay for his lawyer. Oh. I said, what? <laughs> and, 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 or his appeal. And I was like, what are you thinking? He said, 30000 I said, John, f- are you out of your fucking mind? You're, 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 you're extorting um, retirement homes for their linen bills. That's what it was, by the way. Like retirement. You're, like you're ripping off like old people. Like retirement homes, you should be ashamed of yourself. And no, I'm not paying. Because you're going to lose the appeal. And you're going to lose the appeal. You have no shot at the appeal. Therefore, I will not be helping you with your legal. Like, it's just so crazy. But I did, I did think about, you know, him being in prison. And this is, uh, you know, I don't even know if I could do this. But talk about a great podcast. If I could fill up the okay, old canteen and do some yeah. prison interviews and we do a podcast, you know. I mean, what else is he doing, right? <laughs> I did. I reached out to a couple of his buddies. I'm like, look, I'm sure he hates me. But just throw that out there and see if he bites. And if he does, call me. So I don't know. Yeah, where is he at now? <laughs> 